to Remix Church. We are so glad you're here this morning. Have you come ready to worship today? Come on, have you come with a praise this morning? Our God is good and faithful and amazing. Father, we enter your courts with thanksgiving and into your courts with praise. We give thanks to you and we bless your name because he's good, amen. Has he been good to you this week? Amen. For those of you joining us online, welcome this morning. We are so glad that you are tuning in with us this morning. We want you to worship right where you are. Now, come on, Remix Church. Can we put our hands together this morning? And let's pray. 
Father, we exalt you in this place today. We give you glory and honor. We invite your presence into this place. Holy Spirit, come and have your way today. We give you full authority. Come and breathe upon us today. Now we will stand and rejoice as one people lifting one voice. You're worthy of glory, worthy of honor, and worthy of praise. We will shout and proclaim the greatness of your hope. You're worthy of glory, worthy of honor, and worthy of praise. See, you are holy. You are holy. The whole earth sings your praise. The whole earth sings your praise. My God, you are holy. Yes, you are holy. The whole Your goodness, we will sing. Hallelujah to the King. You're worthy of glory, worthy of honor, and worthy of praise. I'm now redeemed from my past. Your people dance because we're free at last. You're worthy of glory, worthy of honor, worthy of praise. This morning ready to pour out a praise on King Jesus because he's so worthy of all that I have to give so come on are you ready to pour out a praise this morning your best praise the highest praise so we pour out our best for you we pour out our best for you. we pour out our best for you 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 place today we thank you for your goodness father we thank you for your word that declares your blessing over our lives father as we embark on this new year this first month of the year father we want to think of your word and and how you tell us that we're blessed coming and we're blessed going that we are the head and not the tail that we are filled to overflow. So Father, this morning we just receive your word and we receive your blessing over our lives today. Amen. The 
thankful for the favor of the Lord, for his blessing upon you and your children and their children and their children's children. It doesn't just stop with me and with you, but it continues on that favor and that anointing and that call and that blessing. And I think that's why it's so important that we create an atmosphere and we create that for our children and in our homes so that we can continue that legacy going on and on. Because how will they know if we don't show them? Amen, amen. We have come to the part in our service this morning where we want you to participate in the worship experience through giving today. If you are in house here in just a few moments, you could come forward and give to the left, the right. You could text to give. You can give online. If you're joining us online this morning, you can participate as well. You can text to give and you can give online. But just give out of an obedient heart, doing what God has called us to do, doing what he's told us to do in his word as far as our giving is concerned knowing that you will never, ever outgive him. He will always give back and then some. Amen. So if you're in house, you can come forward now and you can give. And I encourage you to continue standing and let's worship together.
a shout of praise today if you know him to be a miracle worker with every hand stretched high lord we thank you today that we can come into your gates with thanksgiving and into your courts with praise and declare that this is the day the lord hath made we will rejoice and be glad in it and we declare healing from the front to the back deliverance from the front to the back breakthrough from the front to the back and lord we pray for a new year that there will be a new wave of your presence and glory that will sweep through this place today in the name of your son Jesus and we believe and we expect come on lift your hands up real high if you're expecting a God who does miracles a God who does breakthrough come on if you know you're in the right place today with every hand stretched high sing it come on come on One more time with every hand for a You know, he never stops working. I was watching uh, I was watching that game last night that they played in negative five degree cold with 30 mile an hour winds. And all the fans showed up. 
paid money. And now I, they had fans in the stands that had their shirts off. <laughs> but they were fans of the team that lost. And I was just thinking, if people will pay money, we didn't charge you to come in here. We might charge you to leave. <laughs> if people would pay money to go throw their shirts off and cheer for their team that loses, how much more so can we come into the comfort of a building and lift up a Jesus who's already won it, conquered it, and gave us the victory? Why don't you lift your hands one more time to a miracle worker, Lord. We thank you that we can come into your gates with thanksgiving. We don't praise you because we're Pentecostal. We don't praise you because we have a theology to praise you. We praise you because you are who you are. Come on. Come on, last time, lift your voice, lift your voice. Shout in your own way. Lift up a voice of triumph. Remain standing. Come on, give Jesus a shout of praise like he already healed you, delivered you, set you free. Yeah. Remain standing. It's always good to be in church. If this is your first time to remix, we welcome you. And uh, we're just excited about what God is doing. Somebody say, the best is yet to come. Give it up for the worship team. They're here early. Hey. Cedric didn't rob a bank. He's coming off the weather. <laughs> he might have, but love covers here. A multitude. <laughs> He'll tithe it. It'll be all right. Actually, he was in New York during the night. He got here barely in time. Flight was delayed two times. But we committed around here. Amen. They texted me last night. So Michelle said, uh, you might not have Cedric tomorrow. He's in New York at the airport. I said, what's he doing at the airport in New York? <laughs> We do have things going on. We have women are starting a new Bible study January 29th. I think this is the book, Lord, I Want to Know You. This is my latest, but I'm just kidding, right on book. I believe that's on a Monday at 7 p.m., right? On January 29th. We're also, for the month of January, the next few weeks, we're doing Wednesday night Bible study. We did this past Wednesday. Whole section filled up. We had a good turnout. You need to be here on Wednesdays. Back in the day, we had church Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. You can handle a little midweek every now and then. You need to be here on Wednesday night. We're doing Bible study, and we do it right in here. It's, it's borderline church, so show up on Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. We're going to do that for the next few weeks and see what God says. How many of you know the best is yet to come? We also have new, we just recorded a new episode of Word Up. They'll be releasing that next week. You can go on the website, go up to where the menu is and scroll down. You'll see Word Up. You click it and there'll be, you know, a little word entertainment for you. <laughs> we do that. We record that stuff off the cuff. You never know. And uh, it's not completely off the cuff, but we don't script it. And we just dive into a thought from the last weekend sermon message. Um, for our digital space so you can check that out in the coming days. Somebody say amen. amen. Somebody say word up. You need more word. You need to word up your the word what is it? Word up the word in 2024. But great things are happening. 
And uh, it's the playoffs. My team didn't have to play this weekend. That means we're pretty much Super Bowl bound. Amen. <laughs> we'll talk about that later. It's always um, great to have John Walford in the house. I called him Thursday morning. And I said, what are you doing? You know, he's, he's retired. And... Uh, <laughs> He's one of from that. He's one of the few from that. I was thinking about this. He's one of the few from that generation that uh, knew knew how to let it go. <laughs> and he didn't have to. And um, he still has years on him. But he felt like he wanted to leave a legacy. He had raised someone up in his church. And uh, John Watford first. He's been here a few times. But he um, met, I think I knew him since I was four years old. I baptized his two daughters in their bedroom when we were (laughs) four or five. Like I prayed for them and they received every gift of the Spirit in that moment. (laughs) And uh, it took a little more with Bethany. It did a little better with Bethany. Charities, you know, it's coming around. I got the Holy Ghost in them and a couple of their stuffed animals, and supposedly it's on a VHS somewhere. But uh, four years old, that's a long time. My dad pastored in New Orleans, and he pastored in New Orleans, and I just got invited the other day to go to Mardi Gras and do street preaching. No, 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 I'm not going. Michelle said, I'm not allowed to go to Mardi Gras and pray. I said, it's for the gospel. I'll bring you back beads. <laughs> Everybody got excited. You spiritual people, I'll send you down there. But man, all the way back to New Orleans days, the beignets, I remember it. I remember it. So he's known me since I was four. So we will edit the streaming here because he might have a story or two. Uh, <laughs> so he's got stories. I remember he came to Denver, Colorado. I think you came to preach for my dad in Denver, right? And I had gotten suspended from Maranatha Bible College. It's not college, high, my high school, for clogging a sink. And, <laughs> and remember, I had to, for punishment, I had to wax the entire gym floor. Remember that? But... <laughs> He came with us one day to go do it at night, and uh, he looked at us and says, David, why are you waxing the gym floor? <laughs> but that's how far back. And those, those stories, just remember, they're my testimony. My testimony. But John Watford's awesome. He's amazing. His wife's Bonnie here in the back, hiding behind the subs. And they've known me a long time. I want you to welcome Pastor Bishop John Watford to Remix Church. You may be seated. Um, He said it was testimony. I said it was a test. They're close anyway. You know, we have, uh, we're delighted to be with you. If you don't mind, I'd like to get right to the word. Um, There is a, we are all living in different seasons of life. Um, A while back, I looked and I went to the bathroom. I looked into the mirror and there was a guy with white hair staring at me. And it took, me, it took me back because, you know, I'd always, in my mind, I pictured myself with long, dark, auburn hair. And when I looked in the mirror, it suddenly, for the first time, it dawned on me, my hair was no longer auburn brown. It was pretty well white. And so it hit me that I had gone into a new season, a new season. And every one of us are in a different season of life. We are in a different season in our walk with God. We are in a different season as to who we are. And there is the people, there is the you that other people know or think they know. And there is the you that your family knows. But in the middle of the night, 2 o'clock in the morning, you're laying there awake. There is the you that is in a season that nobody else knows about but you and God. And so from the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 3, verse 1, I will probably only read verse 1. 
The Bible says, to everything there is a season and a time for every purpose under heaven. To everything there is a season and a time for every purpose under heaven. I'm going to reverse that just a little bit and let us, uh, because of the singing that you've done, it's absolutely perfect for what I'm going to be speaking on. I'm going to talk to you today about God's hourglass. Now, when God looks, when God talks about time and God talks about seasons, He's not talking about like a calendar year, like today is January the 14th, I believe, and the time is somewhere right around 11 o'clock. That's not how God looks at it. But God has an overall, He has a purpose. God has a purpose that is universal. God has a purpose that is eternal. God has a purpose for the nation. God has a purpose for the state. God has a purpose for your community. God has a purpose for your church. And God has a purpose for you. The Bible tells us in the book of Romans chapter 8, and God makes all things work together for good to them that love God and are called according to his purpose. And when you begin to go back, and in the actual Greek language of that, it reads just slightly different. It says that God is at work with you, making all of his purposes to be established. Now, they are his purposes under his heaven. And so when we're talking about seasons of life, we're talking about what God has planned and purposed for you, you the individual. Because God's purpose for you, even though it is for everyone to go to heaven, that's God's purpose. Every man to be saved, that's God's purpose. But God has an individual purpose. He has an individual plan. You know, when I was young, uh, I used to really struggle with that thought about, well, what is the purpose of my life? What, you know, what is God going to do? Or what, what does life mean? And we've all struggled with that. But then as I began to grow in God, I began to realize that God has a major purpose for us, me to be in relationship with Him. God has an overall purpose for my walk with God. God has another purpose for me in things such as His desires. That's something that He wants accomplished, and He wants to accomplish it through me. So God has a plan for your life, a purpose for your life. He, there's things that one, he wants above all else that you and he be in right relationship. That is God's number one purpose. God is more concerned about a relationship with you than what you do. Amen. Listen, anybody can sing the song. Anybody can go through the motions. But God is looking for a real intense and personal relationship with you. And that's your number one purpose in life. Amen. Your number one purpose is to know him and to enjoy him. Amen. So the Bible says to everything there is a season and a time and a purpose under heaven. So now that we've established a purpose, let me again clarify. What you do for God is the result of your relationship with God. You can do things, you can do spiritual things, you can do religious things apart from God. But it's not the same as having a relationship that prompts and that out of that relationship flows the ministry, the walk, what you do for God. Amen. You know, it, that's what it's about. What we do for God is just the fruit of our relationship with God. It's not painful. It's, some people call it a sacrifice. But when you love God, it is not a sacrifice to do whatever He wants done. It's not a sacrifice. It's not a sacrifice to attend church. It's not a sacrifice to read my Bible. It's not a sacrifice to give. It's, a re it's out of that relationship because I love, I just do. I don't even think about it. It's just automatic. But the Bible tells us in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, he says, to every thing. Now, in the Hebrew language, the word thing is not there. It literally reads, to every there is a season. 
to every. The word every in the Hebrew language is the word kal. And kal means the entirety, the totality. So that no matter where you are, no matter how old you are, no matter what, what life events that you've experienced, that there is in that totality that God has purpose. That God has purpose. I was preaching in Newburn. I had been, I was pastoring in New Orleans, but I was, I had been visiting and I came back to Newburn to pre, uh, to visit. And while I was there, the pastor asked me to preach. And in, and in the, just in the middle of the preach, the Lord spoke to me in my spirit and said, there's a young woman here that last Friday night, she was date raped. And I'm thinking, now the house is packed. There's 350, 400 people there. And I'm thinking, God, I, I don't know any of these people here. And it was like God was saying, it's okay because I do. And so at the end of my preach, I was given the altar invitation, and I stopped. And let me tell you something. If, if you haven't heard from God and if you miss it, it's terrible. And so I got up there, and I was preaching, and I came to the altar service, and I said, I've got to stop here. I said, the Lord told me to say this, to tell someone specific this. Now, remember, God has a purpose for everything. I said, the Lord told me that last Friday night that you went on a date and that you were date raped in that at that time and and the church went silent me and everybody's just thinking and looking around and suddenly this young woman who was a marine short blonde hair got up came down to the altar she looked at me I reached over and I touched her shoulder and she just crumbled and she began to weep and she wept and she said, Friday night, she said, I thought he was my friend but, and he forced and then he, I told him no and, and he raped me and and I put my arm around her and I told her these words. I said, God wants me to tell you that in behalf of every man, every word that's ever abused a woman, that I apologize and so deeply sorrow. And God wants me to tell you that he was there with you when it went going, going through. God wants me to tell you that he didn't want it to happen, but he did not abandon you while you were going through that time in your life. It wasn't God's purpose, but God has a purpose for you. Your life did not stop that night that that happened to you. The plan of God is not stopped by men who get in the way. Because God knew it all along the way, but he wanted her to know that he was there. He was there. To everything there is a season. Now the word season in the Hebrew language is the word is zaman. Zaman. Now, when God has an, God's hourglass, God's timepiece, God's seasons, the word season in Zaman in the Hebrew language means that there is a set time when something will begin and a set time for it to end. Not only is it established on earth, like we say that we are in the winter season. I've seen winter seasons that were quite warm. I've seen winter seasons that were quite cold. I know they say that winter starts December the 21st and it ends, I don't know, whenever it ends. But you know, that's not how God does it. God's seasons are periods of appointed time. They're, they're periods where that God is beginning to do something. He's already planned it in the past. He's going to work at it. Until it reaches the point, and then the season will change. I remember that now my wife and I had been married 46 years, and, and so I was single for 23 years. And as long as I was single, that was my season. And then, but when I got married, my single season had to stop. Now, for some of you young men and husbands, you need to hear that. And you wives, and you can pat me on the shoulder on the way out. But there was a season of my singleness, and there was a season of, of marriage when I was a married man, a husband. And then there was a season when that children came into our lives. And then one of the hardest things I had to deal with was that there was a season when the children married and left the, our house. I didn't know when that season was going to end. 
So what I needed to do was whatever time that, that they were in my season, I needed to make the most of that season. So you're in a season right now. you got to learn how to make the most of the season. You need to ask the questions, God, what are you doing? God, what do you want to do? God, how can you use me? God, whatever you want, the answer is just yes. I don't even have to pray about it, God. The answer is just yes. So in that season, it is an appointed time. It will begin and it will end. And you say, well, you're talking about my life and my death. Listen, your life is a season. It is appointed unto man once to die, and after this, to judgment. Your life is a season, but you're going to have seasons of life. You're going to have seasons when that God is pouring His Holy Spirit out on you passionately. And then you're going to have seasons when you wonder where God is. You're going to have seasons when everything you touch seems to turn to gold. And then you're going to have seasons when that doesn't seem that no matter what you do, nothing's working. Well, God can't be in that. Why cannot God be there? You know, you and I, we need to stop judging our seasons by the visual outward and say, well, God's in this because it's producing. Or I've got a great harvest or I'm very happy, or I'm making a lot of money. That must be God's will. That must be the season. But can I tell you something? God is in the barren season. God is in the season when you're hurting. God is in the season when the doctor comes out and says you've got cancer. God is in the season when, when, uh, when that first Christmas morning when my wife and I, all of our children had, had married and moved away and and it was just her and I on Christmas morning, and it had not been that way for 20 years, and suddenly it was quiet in our house. We had entered a new season. I mean, think about it. You're so accustomed to open up presents and under the tree with little kids and, and your children and, it, and all the noise and the paper and the wrappings, and then it's just you and your spouse, and you walk over that way and yeah, here, here's another one. Uh-huh, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. And then she walks off to the bedroom, and you're just standing there, and you realize, this ain't fun. <laughs> I liked it better when my kids were little. And I remembered my wife came through, and I said, baby, I said, it's mighty quiet here. I said, but we've entered into a new season. So when you're always going to be in a season, and there's a beginning of that season, and there will be an end to that season. It is what you do in the middle of the season. It's how you draw close to God when things are good, and how you draw close to God when things are not good. It's how that you learn to walk by faith and not by sight. It's learned that you may not see him working, but as you sang today, he is at work. He is at work when you are asleep. He's at work when you awake. For the Bible says, he that watches over you neither sleeps nor slumber. The Bible says, he goes before you to prepare the way. He's in tomorrow and he's just waiting for you to catch up. So while you're in that season, and remember, it's not going to last forever. For, listen, it could be good. And as it was with Joseph telling the Pharaoh, there's going to be seven years of plenty, but it's going to be followed by seven years of famine. There's going to be times when that you're going to reap great harvest. And you say, oh, God is doing this. It's great. And then there's going to be times you're going to sow seed. And just have to wait for them to come up. There's going to be times when that during those seasons, remember they're appointed. There's a, there's a beginning with God and there's, a there's an end of it. And then, but at the end of every season, there is a new season. So while I'm in the season and I'm at, I need to ask these questions. And very quickly, number one, I need to ask, all right, God, what are you, what are you doing? Can I tell you something? He's never answered <laughs> never answered. You know why? Because he wants me to learn to trust. 
As long as I have answers, I'm not trusting. That's it. As long as I can see what he's doing, then I'm not walking by faith. I'm not trusting. But when you get to that point in your life where you begin to acknowledge that he is right now working with me, causing all things to work together for good, and when it's good, is good. And when it's not so good, it's not good, but it's still good. So what we do, we ask the question, what are you, all right, God, what are you trying to teach me? What are you trying to teach me, God? Now, you know, I don't know about you. I love to learn things, but not the hard way. But sometimes that's the only way I learn. And then the... Last question is, during a season, is God. Now, I've got, to, I've got to admit, I do a lot of struggling and a lot of the other stuff before I get to this point that I'm about to tell you. And that is, all right, God, what are you trying to do in me? Oh, God, I loved it when I could say to that young woman, God was there with you. Hallelujah. Bless you. I love it when I'm able to see things, and they're, but they're external. I never get past the season, but until I deal with, what are you doing in me? What do you want to do in me? You see, I can't move into the next season, but until he's done a work in this season. I can't move forward but until I've met him like Isaiah did in Isaiah chapter 6, where he said, I went to the house of God. He said, I was broken. I was grieving. I was hurting. He said, my uncle Uzziah died. The king died. He said, so I went to the house of God. I'm looking for some clarity. I'm looking for some purpose. I'm looking for something to give me some answers. And when I got to the house of God, he said, I saw the Lord, and he was high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. And I heard the angels crying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord and then instead of joining in and shouting praise God hallelujah he said I got a glimpse of myself and then you all realize I was undone I was unclean and I came from a people of unclean lips you see before Isaiah could become the prophet that God wanted to use he had to take him through a season so that there was something he had to deal with on himself you know, it's so much better when other people are dealing, well, you know, she needs to get her attitude together. You know, husbands, I would not say that to your wife. You know, don't, don't do that. It'd be so much easier if, well, you know, a brother so-and-so would just straighten up. No, can I tell you something? It's not about brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so. It's not about your neighbors. It's not about your boss, man. It's not about the fellow workers. It's not, about, it's not even about your children. Can I tell you, it's not even about your dog. You know what it's really about? It's about you. It's about you because, listen, God doesn't say, well, I'm going to save the whole world and they're all going to progress at the same rate at the same time and everybody's going to love one another and treat one another right. That is not biblical. That is not, that's not scriptural. Here is what scriptural. He that begun a good work in you will continue that work until it is finished until the day of the Lord. Now that is scriptural. When you're in a season, you need to ask the question, God, what are you trying to do in me? I'm going to, I'm going to have to hurry, but I'm going to give you, let me give you a personal testimony. I had been, now, I, was, I came up rough, okay? I came up very rough, alcoholic, drugs, shooting, stabbings, et cetera. You know, fightings. Uh, I mean, I came up rough. And um, I, I got saved while I was living with, living with another man's wife. Um, and this is not bragging. You see, it doesn't take any effort at all to be a pig. No effort at all. But I got saved. I mean, I really got saved. I got saved to the point I was so grateful. 
I was anything he wanted. And so I'd been saved six weeks or eight weeks or something. And I'm and kneeling in my bedroom in prayer. And I used to, sp- I would spend hours in prayer and hours in the word every day. I was still working, but you know, I, I just had an insatiable desire to be with the Lord. And so I got on my knees beside the bed one day and I said, all right, God, if there's anything you want, anything you want at all, God, you just let me know and I'll do it. You ever, anybody ever prayed like that? God, tell me what you, whatever you want, God, the answer is just, just can I tell you something? You've got to be very, very careful how you pray that. And all of a sudden, now I will stand before God. This is absolutely, all of a sudden, I just heard an inner voice that said, you robbed Bill Cox's store. I want you to go back and tell him that you did it. Because me and it's another guy. I want you to go back and tell him that you did it. And I want you to wait right there. You know what came out of my words? You know what my words were? I rebuked that devil. Yeah. I mean, that's truly what I did. I, re- I, I rebuked that. And it wouldn't leave me. And so, you know how you push things aside that you don't want to hear? You know? Just, you know, push aside. And then you, what you do, you increase your spiritual activity, you know. Start going to church more, you know. Talk more about God, you know. Listen to the Christian radio, that kind of stuff. Anything to drown out that still inner voice that said. So it went on for a period of time. And, and, and it kept dealing with me, dealing with me. And finally, I got an idea. I wrote a check for the amount that I figured that I owed the man that I had taken from him and so I put it in an envelope and I I put the address and the name and so forth and I stuck it in my Bible and I said well I'm going to mail this and it stayed in the Bible for about two weeks and God just wouldn't let me go God remind me I told you to go tell him I told you to go tell him remember remember I talked about seasons you got to ask what God is doing in you God, what are you doing in me? God, what do you want in me? Listen, there, listen, there's got to, listen, when you come out of a season, there must be less of you and more of him. When you go through the season, it is not just so that for external things, it's for an internal change that will create an eternal value. Amen. So in that season, you know, God was, and God just would not let me mail it. I mean, I kept thinking about, no, I even put a stamp on it. Two stamps, so it would get there. And finally, after a period of weeks, I, we were in a period of drought. I said, all right, God. I said, the very next time it rains, I can't go to work, I'm going to go do it. Well, the weather report, no rain. I got up the next morning, cats and dogs were falling out of the sky. And I looked at it, and I, I pulled the envelope out of my Bible. I prayed. All right, God. I went, I drove down, it was only a few blocks away, the store where had people in it, and I walked over, and I waited till everybody was gone, I walked over to Al, and I said, uh, Al, can I talk to you? He looked at me, he said, sure, come on back to my office, we went back to his office, and I said, Al, I said, I'm so-and-so, I know who you are, I said, I want you to know that I and I didn't call the person my name. I said, we did this, and I'm so sorry. And I said, I, but I got saved, and, I, and God told me I had to come here. I said, now, Al, I'm going to stand right here, so if you want to call the police, I'll, I'll sta- I'm going to stand right here. I won't go anywhere. And Al looked at me, and he said, I knew it was you. He said, I knew it was you. I said, Al, I'm so sorry. I said, but I'm, I said, if you want to call the police, I'm going to stand right here. He said, no. He said, I'm not going to. He said, but this, he said, this is what I want you to promise me, that you'll never do anything like this again. Man, the tears are rolling down. My heart is broken open. And, and it's just that I am humbled. I am broken. I, there's nothing left of me at that moment. And 
I said, Al, I said, listen, here's a check. I said, this is what I, I figured out that I owed you. And he, he wouldn't take it. He said, no, John, no, no. About two years later, I got a call to go to the hospital. And there was a man in the hospital, and he was dying of cancer. And I got to the hospital. I went to the room and opened the door, and it was Al Cox. He looked at me. He said, John, Mr. Johnny, he said, well, thank you for coming. He said, you know, I'm not a Christian. He said, but what I saw in you that day made me begin to believe that there is a God. And he asked me, he said, would you pray for me? I want to know the Jesus that changed your life. I led Al Cox to the Lord. And about two hours later, he went to meet the master. <laughs> to everything, there is a season and a time. The word time in the Hebrew language is the word afat. And it means time and timing. The season does not change, but until the person receives change. And then you are ready to enter into the next season and to God's purpose. Here's what I ask you today. With every head bowed just for a moment and no one looking around, just for a moment. I'm, I won't tarry with this. How many of you sense that you're in a season right now that you're struggling with? Can I just, hands up just for a moment back down. Yes. 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 Hands going up all over. Thank you. You can put them right back down. Can I tell you something? God is at work. God is at work. As our keyboardist is coming. God is at work. How many of you Know what it means to go from one season to the next season. You, you, you felt it when, it when the shift in the, took place. You felt a shift in the environment. You felt a shift in the spiritual realm. You felt that shift. You know why it happened? If it went for good, it was because you and God met at the altar. And there at the altar, you poured yourself out to him. Here am I, Isaiah said. Send me. God, I pour myself out. God, I no longer demand my way. God, I'm not telling you any longer how to do. God, I'm not blaming anybody else. God, this is me. This is me, God. God, this is me. Lord, I want you to do something in me, God. I want to know what you're doing. I want to know why you're doing it, but more important, God, I want you to do something in me. I've been looking for seasons to change, but they don't seem to change. Why? Because God is waiting for you. The season will change. When you've poured out on the altar, would you stand with me, please? Blessed be the name of the Lord. Let's pray. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name. Listen, honey, you're going through that struggle. Listen, it's very painful. You're going through that struggle. I want you to know something now. He's not abandoned you. He said, yea, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. You're going through that struggle right now. But listen, I want you to know that weeping endures for a night, but joy is coming in the morning. There's a season of weeping, and there's a season of joy that's right around the corner for you. But you got to remember, God is waiting for you at the altar. God is waiting for you. He's going to do a healing in that process. He's going to heal some brokenness. He's going to do some restoration. But just remember, even in your weeping, He's never abandoned you. He's there. You ready? 
If you're ready for God to do it, just leave your seat. Come join me here at the altar. You're ready for God to listen. Are you ready for a change of season? Are you ready for God to do something in you? Listen, if you, listen don't, look, don't say, well, I'm going to do it so my season will change. What you do, you do it so that you change. That you become more and more into his likeness. That's what you're looking for. God is wanting to do something in you that changes in you. That changes in you. Hallelujah. Pastor Heath, would you come and join me? I'm going to ask if you would, some of you, while you're singing, Michelle, I'm going to ask if some of you ladies would come and join me and begin to pray with these ladies that are around these altars. And some of you young men, some of you men who know how to touch the hem of God's garment, there are some young men up here that's going through some seasons in their life. And I'm going to tell you something, seasons are struggles. Seasons, seasons require it. But I want you to know that it's worth every ounce of struggle. Some of you men come and pray with these. Some of you ladies come and pray with these. Pastor Heath.